Dr. Lee Ho Sang, Chair of the IPCC, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Singapore. This is the first time that Singapore is hosting a meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and we are honoured to do so. The scoping meeting is an important session that will lay the foundation for drafting the next synthesis reports of the sixth assessment report, or AR6. This meeting, as with recent IPCC meetings, is carbon neutral. I would like to commend the IPCC for practicing what you advocate. This meeting takes place at a time of turbulent change. We are seeing geopolitical shifts, rapid and disruptive technological advancements, and changing trade patterns that are forcing us to rethink traditional models and practices. To effectively address any global issue, including climate change, we need a strong, united, global response. However, the multilateral system is under strain. With the rise of nationalists, isolationists, and protectionist movements, Despite awareness and concern about climate change being at its highest, some governments at one end of the spectrum allow forests to be burned to clear land for economic development and still use coal for energy generation. At the other end, other governments respond to green demands and threaten to impose green border tax and trade barriers. We all have to work together to counter these forces and strengthen the support for multilateral cooperative frameworks. We must not take our eyes off the long-term existential challenge of climate change. Otherwise, citizens will take their cause to the streets and reason will fail to rule. Citizens around the world have come to recognize climate change for what it is the defining issue of our times. We saw last month many climate strikes and rallies held by young people all over the world demanding urgent and ambition climate action. Young people echo each other very quickly. In Singapore too, our youth turned out for our first ever climate rally and how this impacts their future. We have to give them the confidence that we are taking their concerns seriously. It's our responsibility to work together with them to address this challenge. We are pleased that UN SecGen convened the Climate Action Summit last month. It has helped to galvanize global climate action. But we need to work to sustain the momentum and widen the support circle for the many initiatives launched at the summit. Everyone every country matter. So even though Singapore contributes only 0.11% of global emissions, we will demonstrate our commitment to support the global efforts to address climate change too. This is why at the UN Climate Action Summit, Prime Minister Lee reiterated our commitment to do our full share. It's not going to be easy for countries to deliver their, package, their Paris commitments. Singapore too needs to work hard to curb our carbon emissions growth so that we can peak and stabilize our emissions around 2030. This is a stretch target for everyone. And for Singapore, we have limited access to clean energy. We are a small and highly urbanized city state, but we will not let up. Of late, like many countries, Singapore is experiencing the effects of climate change. Last month was our hottest and driest September on record. The highest mean daily maximum temperature reached 33 degrees, exceeding the previous record of 32.2 degrees set in September 1997. Our weather is getting warmer, our rainstorms heavier, and dry spells more pronounced. Sea level rise threatens our island nation state. Nevertheless, we are not paralyzed by despair. 
Since our early days as a fledgling nation facing great odds, Singapore has always faced our problems squarely. We even found ways to turn a challenge into an opportunity. It is with this resolve that we must tackle climate change and it means we will act with boldness and vision that is part of our Singapore DNA. Let me share three ways in which we are planning ahead and taking decisive action. First, we have been taking early action and stepping up efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. The IPC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees or SR 1.5 highlighted that global warming could reach 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by as early as 2030, should we continue along today's trajectory. We knew early on we cannot continue business as usual. Although we have very limited sources of renewables apart from solar, we are pushing the boundaries and developing innovative ways to transition to a low-carbon future. Singapore is the first country in Southeast Asia to implement carbon tax. Our carbon tax comes into force this year without exemption for any industry or sector. No exemption. The carbon tax sends a crucial economy-wide price signal to reduce emissions. The tax is not raised for fiscal purposes. We're not going to build hospitals and schools with it. But we want to spend it spend the $1 billion in carbon tax revenues collected in the initial years to incentivize and support companies in their transition towards green, carbon-efficient technologies. We're making hefty investments into research and development for longer-term solutions to decarbonize our grid, industries, even our buildings. $900 million have been set aside for the urban solutions and sustainability domain under our National Research, Innovation and Enterprise Plan. We welcome multidisciplinary collaboration to discover new knowledge and solutions across areas such as water and food supply resilience, urban mobility, energy and land management. For example, we are driving adoption of super low energy and zero energy buildings. We are also studying the potential of clean fuels such as hydrogen and carbon capture, utilization and storage. Because water has always been a matter of national security concern, we have diversified into weather resilient sources of water, like new water and desalinated water. Energy has become central to our water resilience. PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency, is therefore studying the potential of generating energy through water, not hydroelectricity, but what we call blue energy or osmotic energy, arising from the salinity gradient across water streams. With the collocation of our new water and desalination plants, we could recover blue energy from the plant's waste brine systems. The pilot projects will demonstrate the potential in harnessing water, waste and energy synergies. If UB succeeds, we will one day pro be producing energy from water, even while we produce water from energy. We have rightly put mitigation action as a key focus of our contribution against climate change. We are also mindful that we are unable to reverse climate change completely. So adaptation must take equal importance, especially for Singapore. Because Singapore is vulnerable to sea level rise, our Prime Minister too recently announced a comprehensive nationwide effort to further protect our coasts, low-lying areas and communities. As a low-lying island, this will be a huge but necessary undertaking. This will probably cost Singapore $100 billion or more over the next 50 or 100 years. To adapt to climate change, our plans will incorporate nature-based solutions. To boost natural defences such as mangroves, we take both hard and soft engineering approaches. To mitigate coastal erosion and actively restore our mangrove areas. Beyond coastal protection, 
we integrate nature-based solutions into our city planning. Over the years, we have planted here in tiny Singapore over 2 million trees and built more than 350 parks and four nature reserves, including our UNESCO-listed botanic gardens right in the heart of the city. Under the Forest Restoration Action Plan, additional 250,000 native trees and shrubs will be planted. The benefits are multifold. This will support our biodiversity and importantly, further mitigate climate mitigation and strengthen our resilience. Second, our policies must be evidence-based, even as we harness science and technology, both to take a measured approach against climate change, as well as to develop meaningful solutions to tackle climate change problems. This is why Singapore is supportive of IPCC. The IPCC is regarded as the authoritative voice on climate science. And IPCC's assessment reports and publications are widely used by policy and decision makers, especially in Singapore, in developing our climate change projections and re policy responses. The IPCC plays an important role as an independent body and provides robust, objective and transparent scientific assessments. In today's world, where the discourse on climate change has become politically heightened, the IPCC's role is even more critical in imbuing greater objectivity and scientific rigor in our dialogues and policy choices. The three special reports released over the past two years have significantly shaped our thinking on climate change and sea level rise. The SR 1.5 was a landmark report that made clear that deep emissions cuts are needed to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. The two reports released this year brought to the forefront of our planet's natural defences to climate change, our land, oceans and cryosphere. The special report on ocean and cryosphere is a changing, in a changing climate tells us in no certain terms, in no uncertain terms, that global mean sea levels are rising and this may happen more quickly than previously thought due to increasing rate of ice loss as well as ocean thermal expansion. The upcoming release of AR6 is thus timely. At this juncture where governments and other stakeholders around the world are reassessing their climate commitments and developing their long-term emission plans, R6, AR6 will provide critical scientific evidence for governments to step up our commitments under the Paris Agreement and to assess if the adaptation plans that we have put in place are indeed adequate. In Singapore, robust, credible and objective scientific assessment form the cornerstone of our climate change strategy. We took early action and established the Centre for Climate Research Singapore, CCRS, in 2013. CCRS is one of the few dedicated centres in the region that focuses on research in tropical weather and climate. We are expanding CCRS and will set up a new program office in CCRS next year. The program office will drive the formulation and implementation of a national climate science research master plan and systematically build up our climate science capabilities in Singapore. CCRS and our research institutes and universities together will pursue cutting edge interdisciplinary climate science research. The program office will oversee the recently launched National Sea Level Research Program, a $10 million program which will, over the next five years, fund pioneering proposals and collaborations to help us better understand long-term sea level rise, its variability, regional patterns and extreme weather events. I'm pleased to share that CCRS has launched a grant call for proposals and I look forward to learning about the projects. CCRS will be updating our climate projection in Singapore's third national climate change study, which will be delivered in 2022. Our scientists have already begun work on this. The study will take into account findings from the international scientific community, including IPCC AR6, when it's published, the latest global climate models, 
as well as a national sea level research program. Climate science tailored to the tropics is still a nascent area of research. Through our efforts, we hope, to, we hope to work more closely with IPCC to further strengthen and advance understanding of tropical climates and will share our knowledge and expertise with countries in the region and work with them to enhance capacity to tackle climate change. Third, we are strengthening partnerships at all levels with businesses, individuals, communities and organisations. Ultimately, people are at the core of our sustainability efforts. We are doing this so that our people and our young people in particular are assured of a good future. But governments alone will not be able to tackle climate change. We need to work together and galvanise collective action, both locally and internationally. I'm heartened to see many initiatives in every sector. Let me highlight a few. In the community sector, an organisation called Repair Kopitiam, a ground-up initiative in Singapore, brings together and teaches the community how to repair damaged electrical household items. To date, they have given more than 3,000 items a second lease of life and are cultivating a more sustainable lifestyle among Singaporeans. Industry 2 is doing its part. Rico Asia Pacific is contributing to a circular economy at every stage of their operation, such as employing more cycle, recycled materials and making their products lighter, more compact and more durable. Not forgetting the community, RICO even organises the annual Eco Action Day in Singapore to drive awareness and action for the environment. My ministry also works closely with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, our central bank, to promote green financing. By spurring climate-friendly investments and lending, the financial sector plays a leading role in catalyzing the adoption of sustainability practices in the economy. On the regional and international front, Singapore hosts the WMO's Regional Office for Asia and Southwest Pacific, as well as the ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center, or ASMC. Through the WMO Regional Office, we are collaborating to implement WMO programs and capacity development initiatives. We have committed $5 million to the SMC for a five-year regional capability development program for Southeast Asia. This will strengthen regional cooperation through the sharing of technical knowledge and skills in weather and climate prediction. Ladies and gentlemen, no action is too small. I therefore encourage scientists and experts gathered here today to share and communicate climate science to the public to spur the growing global movement for climate action. As for young people, let us put into the hands of our youth the tools of science to take on the environmental challenges of tomorrow. Let me conclude. The UN Secretary Antonio Guterres has declared that climate change is still running faster than we are. Singapore is clear-eyed about our vulnerabilities. But we can face the future with confidence. But for we know we are taking early, decisive action that is underpinned by robust climate science. This is why Singapore strongly supports the work of the IPCC as the leading international body for the scientific assessment of climate change. I wish you a wonderful visit in Singapore. And please go around and enjoy our island and wish you all a fruitful meeting ahead. Thank you.